Grace of God, folks. Grace is not a New Testament doctrine. Grace is a Bible doctrine. All right. If you have your Bibles now, if you turn with me tonight, the book of Hosea, chapter number 2. Hosea, chapter 2. And verse number 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt, and it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, thou shalt, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bailey. Father, bless this holy book now. Thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now we get into prophecy tonight. We preached the message this morning. It's a very practical thing about the spiritual relationship that Gomer had with Hosea. And it just shows you how the Bible can have many themes in it. And when you go back to the same passage of Scripture, and it can preach about doctrine. It can also preach about spiritual issues. And it can also preach prophecy. Tonight we're going to look at prophecy. I want you to notice what verse number 16 says in Hosea chapter number 2. It shall come to pass at that day, saith the Lord, thou shalt call me Ish-e. Ish-e. Now the Hebrew word for man is ish. The Hebrew word for woman is ish -ah. So what is ish -e? It's my husband. That's what it means. Thou shalt call me my husband and shalt no more call me Bailey. Balaam should be taken from her mouth. Now in this is important. The relationship that Israel had with Jehovah is very important because he was the husband of of these people. A little while later on, we'll try to deal with why he calls himself the husband. But in verse number 19 of Hosea chapter number 2, it says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. He's telling them that something as profound is about to happen. Now, he doesn't betroth the Gentiles to himself. This is God the Father in the Old Testament. He says, it's going to be you, Israel, Ephraim, Judah. I'm going to betroth you. I'm going to have a relationship with you that's going to be altogether different. And he says it's going to be forever. Now, the book of Hosea, chapter number 3 and verse number 4, we get into some issues here that kind of help us pinpoint time as it moves. In Hebrew, in Hosea chapter number 3, in verse number 4, the Bible says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. And this many days so far has been 2,000 years that they have dealt. In verse number 5, Afterwards shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. That locates it, folks. That locates it in the latter days. Now, this is important because it has to do with the second coming of Christ. It has to do with the great tribulation period that's soon to come upon us. We are right at the cusp of it, no question in my mind, because we are in tribulation days now, not the great tribulation and not the tribulation of Revelation. But we certainly are in days of tribulation. No question about it. Now look at Hosea chapter number 6 and verse number 1. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1. The scripture says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Now look at verse number 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Now we have an introduction of time, days. And if you notice, after two days, will he revive us? He's going to revive them. He's going to call them forth to become the head of all the nations again. When does this take place? The day here represents a thousand years. Two days, two thousand years. This long period of time without a king. 
So at the end of 2,000 years, God is going to raise up Israel and they will enter into the third day. That's important because he's going to do something with them. Now look at Matthew chapter 17 when we come to the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 17 and verse number 1. Remember that the New Testament and the Old Testament complement each other. Matthew chapter number 17 and verse 1. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Why not after five days? Why not after four days? After six days. Well, what follows? The seventh day. How long have we been here? Well, it was 4,000 years before Christ when God made Adam, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's been 2,000 years since uh, the time of Christ, which gives us 6,000 years. What are we looking at? We are looking at the 7,000th year. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Here we are in a nation that's a baby. This nation is a baby. If there was a baby nation, it's our nation. We haven't been around long. There are buildings over there in Israel that are five times older than the United States of America. We lived 2,000 years ago, if you were alive as a Jew, you'd have a, you'd have a history, an ancient history that went all the way back to the creation. You could trace your roots all the way back to Adam, like it does in Luke chapter number 3. You weren't some upstart, something that just popped up all of a sudden. You had the prophets, you had the kings, and you had your history. You had your identity, you were fixed in it, no question about it. And when Christ showed up 2,000 years ago, he showed up to a people who were firmly entrenched in their identity and their religion. No question about it. And he had to deal with these people. And they rejected him because he was not what their Talmud, which it didn't exist, but it did verbally. Their Talmud rejected Christ. The oral law rejected him. The law, the law given at Sinai, the oral law rejected Christ. Not the written law, not the written word. Because he took them to the scriptures and said, search, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and there are they that testify of me. I didn't hear anything about the oral law for years after I got saved. What is it? Ignorance? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you how important it is. The oral law, as far as the Jew is concerned, 2,000 years ago was more important than the written law. And the oral law became the basis of the Talmud, which is the Mishnah. And this oral law is what they follow, what they live by. In plain words, it is a greater revelation of the truth of God over what is written in the book that you hold in your hand. Now search the scriptures, he said. This book, this is the written word of God. When you tell me something is oral, it can mean anything and come from anywhere. But if I've got a book that's written, I can trace it back to its source. This is a book. It's very important. So the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter number 17 is transfigured after eight days before these disciples, Matthew, uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, and takes them to the top of the mountain of transfiguration. And if you look at verse number 3 of Matthew chapter, chapter number 17, it says, Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. This is important. Keep those two names in your mind tonight. Moses and Elijah. Why? Because Moses and Elijah shows up when the Lord Jesus Christ is giving them a preview of the kingdom of heaven down on this earth. When he will be glorified among men. When the Lord Jesus Christ will be in Jerusalem as the king of the Jews and the king of the earth. This is a preview of it. But here's what's important about it. In verse number 12 of Matthew chapter 17, the Bible said, But I say unto you that Elias is come already. What's he mean? The Bible says in the book of Malachi, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before that great and terrible day of the Lord. They were expecting Elijah. And now we have Moses and Elijah confirming the identity of Christ on the top of this mountain. And he says to them, Elijah, Elias is come already. Now, I don't want to get off into everything that that means because I've taught it many times in here. But what it has to do with is the offering of the kingdom of heaven to the Jewish people while in their lifetime 2,000 years ago, they, he offered it to them and they rejected it. Notice carefully what's important about this in verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Here is John the Baptist 
who could have been Elijah. Now this opens up an entirely new understanding of the Bible. The Bible is a living book. It's a living word of God. I, I, I shun away, and I do it respectfully, but I shun away from anybody that calls himself a scholar of the Bible. There are no masters of this book. The book's the master. We're students. And I pray that as a student tonight that I can learn and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. He's spoken to them of John the Baptist. Now look at John chapter number 2 and verse number 1. The first miracle the Lord performed. John said it was the first one. John chapter number 2 and verse number 1. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Why third day? Why not second day? Why not fourth day? In the third day there was a marriage. What's a marriage got to do with it? There's a marriage that takes place. A marriage at the third day. Well, after two days, I'll raise thee up, he said. Didn't he do that? I'll raise you up after two days. A marriage takes place. There's a union of God the Father with Israel. This is quite a remarkable thing. Because I'm going to answer the question, I do believe, as to why God is the, fa God is the husband of Israel. Why is he the husband? Why does he want to be their husband? In John chapter number 2, the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The Apostle John says, The beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now we cover in heavy duty stuff. Especially the part in Matthew chapter number 17 that after six days he was transfigured on the top of that mountain. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. How many of you ever heard a, a, a great messages, many good messages preached about the transfiguration of Christ but have you heard it preached dispensationally? Have you heard the actual application of it? Why did it happen? What does it relate to? Why is it so important? It is very important. And it relates to things that are very important. Now look at Ezekiel chapter number 20 and verse number 33. Ezekiel chapter number 20 verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the, among the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you're scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. He says to Israel, I'm going to take you into the wilderness and I'm going to plead with you face to face. Has that ever happened? This is one of the things that you use to understand the scripture. Has it happened? No, it hasn't happened. When will it happen? Well, in Revelation chapter number 12, it says that when Michael and his angels fight against the dragon or with Satan and the dragon prevail not, he's cast out of heaven. And he comes down and he persecutes the woman. The woman is Israel in Revelation 12. What does she do? She flees into the wilderness. The wilderness, one place could be Sila Petra. I've been to Petra. It's quite a remarkable thing. It's called the Rose Red City. You see the treasury. Photographed as you come out of what's called the Sikh. It's a very, very narrow cut between the, between the mountain there. And you go through it. And you come into this most remarkable thing. Nabataean Arabs. Petra. This could certainly be the wilderness that he calls them into. Because there's a reason for the wilderness calling. There's a reason for God calling the children of Israel in the wilderness. Why? He has a controversy with them. They're going to work out some problems. Some issues are going to be taken care of. And he says in Ezekiel chapter number 20 and verse number 37, I will call, cause you to pass under the rod. And he said, I will bring you into the bond of a covenant. And then he says, I will purge out from among you the rebels. Now, what, do you, what happens when he says, I'll purge out the rebels, he's saying that Israel, I'm going to deal with you in the wilderness. Yet I'm going to purge out the rebels. The book of Matthew chapter number 24, the whole book, Matthew chapter 24, the whole chapter. There's no church in there anywhere. Don't let anybody ever drag you into Matthew 24 and call it the church. What is Matthew 24, preacher? Matthew 24 is him dealing with Israel in the wilderness. This wilderness confrontation between Christ and Israel is a very big deal. For example, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Notice he didn't say the church. He said a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and not according to the covenant that are already made. 
So he's going to, the Bible says the day is going to come when he's going to make a new covenant. Covenant with Israel. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 8, the writer of Hebrews quotes this very scripture. He says in Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 8, For finding fault with him he saith, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The writer of Hebrews wants you to understand that Israel is not as something as a has-been that ceases to exist, that has no identity, no existence, no reason to be. But they are very important in the prophecy of God. As I said to you this morning, the key to understanding the tribulation is to understand Israel, not the Gentiles. Israel is the key. But of course, from Genesis to Revelation, Israel is the key to understand the Bible. Because that's who it's, it's written about, Israel. So he said, the days come that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So why would the writer of Hebrews say something like this? Why is it important for him to say it? When he's telling people here as he starts out, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time fast the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath made heir of all things. He starts off the book of Hebrews by saying, here's the one who is the very image and manifestation of God Almighty. He starts it out like that. Then he turns his attention directly to the Hebrews and says that if you trample underfoot his blood, there remaineth no more sacrifice for your sins. There's nowhere else for you to go. And that's it for you. Here we have him quoting, he, quoting the, book of, uh, the book of Jeremiah. Why does he quote it? Because he makes an application. Remember this tonight. When the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. And the New Testament writer makes an application of that Old Testament scripture. What he has said and what he has done trumps every professor in every Bible college in the world. Every one of them. Every last one of them. Because this is the living word of God. And he is inspired of God to write it. Now, don't you, Jeremiah chapter number 3 and verse number 14. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. That's future. But I'm bringing you to Zion, to Zion as your husband. I'm married to you, he said. In Isaiah chapter 54 and verse number 5, the Bible says, For thy maker is thy husband. See that? Thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Then in Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 6, that I read to you this morning. When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. And I spread my skirt over thee. Is that not what Boaz did with Ruth? She was coming to become his bride. I'll spread my skirt over thee. Cover thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. Now, you know why people hate the Jews? I'm going to tell you why they hate them. They hate them because they're different. They hate them because they're the apple of God's eye. They hate them because they are God's chosen people. That doesn't make them better than me. It doesn't make them better than anybody else. But it puts them in a classification of their own. Which means that God the Father is going to deal with the Jew. Then he's going to deal with the Gentile. And if we can understand the places where he deals with the Jew. And compare it with what he does with the Gentile. We won't mix the two together. Because when we start mixing them together. That's when we get into confusion. So he says. I am your husband. In Jeremiah chapter number 3 and verse number 8, the Bible said, And I saw when all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. This is a husband speaking about his wife committing adultery. Spiritual adultery is the issue. He said, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. When she committed adultery, I gave her a bill of divorcement. Are you following along with me tonight? God is dealing with Gentiles in the Old Testament, but he's dealing with Israel. 
And what he does with Israel bears directly on what happens to the Gentiles. You see, 2,000 years ago, when Elias could have been John the Baptist, that would have been an issue where the kingdom of heaven would have come in the lifetime of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have come. And it would have had a direct effect on all the Gentiles on the earth. And the reason it would have had a direct effect upon all the Gentiles because there would be no such thing as a church age that has lasted for 2,000 years. Israel would have fulfilled their place as being the head of all the nations, a light to light for the Gentiles. All of this. But they refused. When they did, the Apostle Paul says in the last chapter of the book of Acts, seeing you've chosen to do this, lo, I go to the Gentiles. And they'll hear it. See it is? See how the Gentiles... Whatever happens to them, happens to them based on what happens to the Jew. The apostle says, I'll preach to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I want you to notice what he says over here in Hosea chapter number 2 and verse number 16. We started out with this one. He said, backsliding Israel committed adultery and I put her away. But in Hosea chapter number 2 and verse number 16, and it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi. Wait a minute. I thought he gave me a divorce. Yes. But you see, that day is the end of times. It's this day. It's this where the Lord God says, I know I gave you a reading of divorcement, a writing of divorcement. But he said, you're still my wife. I'm going to take you. You're going to be mine. Nothing's going to change that. Why the relationship of husband and wife? Have you read Matthew chapter 1? The relationship that, Christ, that God, the Father now, has with Israel, not Christ, but God the Father has with Israel, gives them a legal right to the throne. A legal right to the throne. And that's important because this has to do with all of the Gentile reign upon all the face of the earth. The law will go forth from Zion. Israel will be elevated once again to the top or head of all the nations. But there is a bride of Christ. And you are the bride of Christ. So why this relationship? Why does the Lord Jesus Christ have a bride? Why can he just save you? I mean, he can save you. Why do you have to be his bride? Over here in the book of Psalm chapter 22 and verse number 30, it says this. Psalm twenty-two thirty. 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be counted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. These people are born of him. They're born of Christ. Well, how can they do that? He had no wife. No, he has a bride. And there's a spiritual union between Christ and his bride. Unlike anything else. Tonight, if you're born again, you are a member of the church of the firstborn. Firstborn. Nobody in that Old Testament was born again. Although one day God will seal all of his family, you are the member of the church of the firstborn. You are the beginning of the strength of God. You are that one that inherits a double portion of the spirit. You are that one that becomes the head of the priesthood of the home. You are a firstborn child of God. You have a spiritual relationship with Christ now that is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. You are his children and his bride. And that's quite a remarkable thing because it's a spiritual thing. And if you love him, he loves you. If you don't love him, he knows you. So the book of Matthew chapter number 24 and verse 3 says this. Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The disciples, after they'd had him all this time, even in Acts chapter number 1, they wanted to know, well, what, what, how do you put all this together? See, they were confused. They didn't understand all of this. For one reason, they didn't have a 66-book Bible. They didn't have all that. Didn't have the New Testament. Wasn't written. So what, how, what is this? What's going on here, they said to him. When shall these things be? Matthew 24, verse 4, he answered them and says, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, right now there's over 100,000 troops amassing at the border of the Ukraine. And Vladimir Putin is nobody's fool. 
And he will, he say, they say he wants to restore the old Soviet Union. And Ukraine was one of the 15 republics that made up the old Soviet Union. This is only one of the many wars. We've had wars in every generation. We just finished a 20-year war in Afghanistan. Wars and rumors of wars. There will always be in every generation a fulfillment of that prophecy. But he said, see not you be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Well, we've had a pestilence show up that we've never had before. And even with the highest technology that we have today, and we've got the technology that they didn't have it in the, in the, in the, in the flu in 1918, we've got technology today, yet they're still dying. It's a pestilence. Earthquakes, divers places. These are all signs of the second coming. You can spend a lot of time talking about these signs. But he said all these are the beginning of sorrows. It's like when a woman is pregnant and she goes into labor. This is exactly what it's referring to. It is the beginning of sorrows. Now watch carefully. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. I don't preach the gospel of the kingdom. I want, to be, I want, you to be, I want to be as clear as I can about that tonight. I preach the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of, kingdom ha the, gospel of the kingdom has something to do with an earthly king and kingdom right here on this earth. Right here. Right here. But he said in verse 15, When therefore you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, when ye shall see... Now, notice how this is taking you into the tribulation period. This is why we've got people out there right now that are preaching that the church is going to go through the tribulation. In just a moment, I'm going to show you a rapture that takes place in the tribulation. But they teach you that the church is going to go through the tribulation. A lot of them are teaching that. And if when you teach that to people, then you can sell them uh, survival gear. One fellow referred to a guy, stuff he was selling on TV is a bunch of slop. <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, food's food. If you're hungry, you can eat about anything, right? But you can sell people things when you make them think that he is, uh, that you're going to go into a time of tribulation. Who knows? There may be, before the Lord comes back, a time where you can't get food. Who knows? Shelves now are empty. They talk about this, you know, all this stuff that's going on. These ships out there off the coast of California and Long Island. They can't get in. They can't, uh, they, can't, they can't get the food out. But he says in verse number 24, There should be false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Plenty of them. And then he said, Neither on the Sabbath day let this not happen. I want you to understand that the only Sabbath that should mean anything to a Christian is the Sabbath you find in the book of Hebrews. For Christ is our Sabbath. Our rest is in him. Note carefully. He said, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that's a special study in itself, but I'm giving it, you, giving it to you tonight to show you how that in the tribulation period, nothing is the same as it is now. We've, I've heard preachers say, well, we're in the tribulation now. No, you're playing games. You don't have a clue. The Bible said that except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be left alive. No, we've, we're not in the tribulation. Not in the tribulation, not at all. Matthew chapter 24 verse 32 says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is a representative of Israel in one of its aspects in the Bible. Then it talks about its branch and so forth. But in verse number 38 it says, As in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So the time that he's talking about in Matthew 24 at the beginning of the tribulation period was like it was in the days of Noah. Luke says, as it was in the days of Lot. 
What was in the days of Lot? Sodomy. What was in the days of Noah? We have a proliferation of marriage and people are going about in their business and they have no idea that time is about to run out for them. So I want you to notice further with me. I want you to look at this. In verse number 48, we have this tribulation period. And the tribulation period is seven years long, except those days should be shortened. No flesh should be left alive. Bottom line is we don't know exactly how long it is because if God shortens the days, who knows? So we have a tribulation period that starts. When does the tribulation start? It starts with a signing of a covenant. A signing of a covenant, the Bible says, with death and hell. That's when it starts. The tribulation period starts then. It doesn't start at the rapture when the church is called up. It starts when they sign a covenant. Is Israel ready to sign a covenant? Well, you better believe they are. They're, they live day by day to whether they will survive or not. When this covenant is signed, the clock starts ticking. It starts ticking. And the tribulation can basically be... Can be, can be separated into two parts. The first three and one half years of it. Then the last three and one half years of it. The first three and a half years is usually called the tribulation. Then the last three and one half years is called the great tribulation. Great because of when you read in Revelation. The intensity of the judgments that come down upon this earth. Get worse and worse and worse. And men will beg for death, and death will flee from them. That's the great tribulation. In Matthew 25, and verse number 1, he said, The kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins. Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to meet with the Jews. He's going to appear to them. When? I do not know. But I do know this. I do know that he's going to take them into the wilderness. He's going to pass them under the rod. And he's going to speak to them. And there's going to be a controversy. And when they see him as he is, these Jews are going to say, where did you get these marks? He said, I got them in the house of my friends. This is in the controversy. This is in the wilderness. Because it's in the wilderness that the Lord Jesus Christ ferrets out, works out the issue between him and them. And then he promises to them, when it is over, after he's purged out the rebels, passed them under the rod, identified himself to them, he says, I'm going to come back. As a bridegroom comes back, I'm going to come back for you. So in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Prepare yourself for that coming. And now look carefully at it. In Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 48, the scripture says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. See this? Why is he talking about delaying his coming? He's talking about it because the Lord had told him, I'm going to come back. Somewhere in the tribulation period, I am going to come back. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins. Have you ever heard this preached as, it's, as if it's Christians? Ten virgins, which took their lamps... And went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now hold on. Hold on for just a moment. Do you think this refers to a Christian? A Christian with no oil? Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. There's no way in the world that if you're a born-again believer tonight... You can be without the Holy Spirit of God. For he seals you. So what's going on here? These are Jews. This is a Jewish context. It's a Jewish place. And the Jews are going to go out and they're going to meet the bridegroom because he's coming now. He went away and now he's coming back. This is about the middle of the tribulation period somewhere. Gone, now coming back. In verse number 8. The foolish virgin said to the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. That has nothing in the world to do with your testimony as a Christian and the Holy Spirit, because it cannot go out. You're sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. Now, 
This is important. And here's why it's important. Because of what happens in Revelation 12, 11. Look at Revelation chapter number 11. Guess who shows up here in Revelation 11? Verse number 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Now this is about half, half of three of seven years. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut up heaven, so forth and so on. Who are these two? Well, who showed up at the top of the mountain of transfiguration? When the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified to enter into his kingdom, who showed up? Moses and Elijah. Elijah, the Bible prophesies in Malachi, I'll send him before the great and terrible day of the Lord. John the Baptist could have been Elijah. As I say before, that's a separate study in itself. But don't you see how it begins to fit together? In the book of Revelation, we have Moses and Elijah show up. What for? Why would Moses and Elijah show up in Revelation chapter number 11? Because the kingdom is coming. That's why. The kingdom is coming and the king is coming. But first of all, they're going to leave here. The Lord, my Lord, why five wise, five foolish virgins must be prepared for what takes place. Look at chapter number 11 and verse number 5. Let's go on down to verse 12. We don't have to read all that. Let's go to verse 12. Revelation 11, 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and so forth and so on. The judgments of God came down upon this earth. But somebody's left it. Somebody's gone. Somebody just got caught up. Come up hither. Isn't that what it says in the early part of the book of Revelation when he comes for the church? He says, come up hither. Well, this is another come up hither. In plain words, this is another rapture that takes place in the middle of the tribulation period. You make a grave error if you try to make this the church because you've put the church through three and a half years of the tribulation and you're having it called out in the midst of the tribulation period. Church has nowhere to, it's no, no part of it. The church is John the, ba John the Apostle. He's a type of it. And he's called up to meet God in the third heaven at the beginning of the book of Revelation. But here you have Jews. You have Moses and Elijah. Remember how important it is to understand what does Moses and Elijah mean when it comes to Israel? Here's what it means. It means that they have met. They are presenting the true Messiah they are preaching the truth, and the Antichrist tries his best to destroy them, and he can't do it. He can't touch a hair on their head until their time is finished. And then when their time is finished, God says, come up hither. And all indications are that their heads pop back on their body, and up they go to meet the Lord. And then they go to what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if you read over there in the book of, I, book of Psalm chapter number 45, you'll see all the guests that are invited to it. And what it does, it makes up the family of God. The family of God. Then to Revelation 19, the heavens open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he comes with the family of God. We have it here in, Re in Revelation chapter number 11. Once again, there's a battle that takes place in the 12th chapter of Revelation. If you notice this battle takes place, it's between Michael, verse 7, and his angels, and the dragon and his angels. And the dragon does not prevail against Michael. Michael's an archangel. He represents Israel. He stands for Israel. Why does he show up in Revelation 12? Israel. Israel. He shows up for them. And he defeats the dragon. When he does, the dragon is cast out of heaven. Cast down to the earth. And the Bible says he knoweth he hath but a short time. How short? Three and a half years. Short time. He's got a short time. Short time. And then he persecutes the woman. Who's that? That's Israel. 
drives her into the wilderness. And that place in the wilderness, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and he meets with his brethren. It is during that wilderness experience that Israel is restored again to the Son of God. Then I'd like to say, I'd like to see that, wouldn't you? They'll mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. They're going to meet him. They're going to look upon him. They're going to, they're going to look upon him and he's going, to, he's going to identify himself to them. And then he's going to come and take them away. I don't know how long. I have no idea how long a period passes between the time they go into the wilderness and Christ appears to them and then he comes back later and shouts for them and calls them up to meet him in the clouds. I don't know. I have no idea. But it's not, I don't suppose it's all that important or God would put it in the text. But the fact that it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So now, what should we be looking for? As I said to you a little while ago, Israel is the centerpiece of the Bible. Israel is the key to understanding the scripture. So how does Israel fit in today? What have you got over there? On the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, you've got this little country, Israel. But make no mistake about it, they've got big guns. They may be a little country, but they've got big guns. And they're going to fight for survival. What they want above all things is peace. They want peace. They, and they do. They genuinely want peace. They want peace. And somehow or another, this Antichrist that shows up in the first part, first half, will work out some kind of a peace agreement with Israel, and they'll sign it. As far as God's concerned, it's a covenant with death and hell. That's what he calls it. But they're going to sign that peace agreement. And then he will enter into the temple of God, and he will profess to be God, and he will say he is God. And the Apostle Paul wrote you in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 that the day is going to come when the man of sin shall sit down in the temple of God professing himself to be God, and the whole world will wander after the beast because of his power to perform miracles and all the else that he's ready to do. Who's going to do that? It's going to be those who reject the light they've got today and the truth they have now. You need to make a choice tonight. You, may, you need to make a decision. You know, there's an awful lot of, a, a lot of hype when it comes to prophecy. And I tried to keep a lot of this just as plain and simple as I could because there's a lot of issues going on here, a whole lot. But I gave you some kind of a chronological understanding of what to look for for the coming of the Lord. So what needs to happen, preacher? Well, for the church to be caught out, nothing. You've heard somebody say, well, then wait a minute. It says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached all over the world. That's what it says. But I'm not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God. So in other words, you're saying to us tonight, preacher, that we don't have to have any signs, any warnings, no fulfillment of prophecy. None of that has to happen before the Lord comes back for us. None of it. Any time when you least expect it, you're going to hear a shout, and away we're going. Amen. Hallelujah. Meet him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And he's going to come back. How many believe he came the first time? No question about it, folks. I heard preachers say this morning, I agreed with him 100%. He said, we have, out, we, have, we have every reason to believe from historical records and everything else that Christ lived 2,000 years ago. He said, now whether you accept him as the son of God or not is a different issue. But you cannot deny that he was here. Right. Amen. You can't do it. And he said, if I go, I'll come again. Are you ready for him tonight? Now, I see a lot of things that make me believe that, that uh, the coming of the Lord draws nigh. A lot of things that make me believe that. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to meet. Thank you for what, what wisdom that you've given us and you've taught us. Father, I believe this house is full of Bible believers tonight. They believe your word. And I'm so thankful for that. I pray you'd bless them. I pray, Heavenly Father, we look for the coming of the Lord. And you tell us in the Bible, if we have that hope in us, we purify ourselves even as we as pure, are pure that the looking for the second advent of Christ has a purifying effect. It separates from the world. It causes us to look upon that which is eternal and to wait for the sun from heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, and amen. All right, let's stand up here tonight, and if anybody would like to come down and pray.